God will care for his people, even in those days where we wonder, God, what am I going to do? Jesus. It's just you, Jesus. It's just you, Jesus. 
louder Nothing can stop you As you hold the power And Jesus, you're the king Tried so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it You choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't deserve it Take the broken things, raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. And I am who you say I am. You cry. Undefeated with the one who is called. Thank you.
I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star is signal fire of grace. Your creation sings your praise is so alive. Promise, don't speak in vain. No syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you speak. Catch your breath On moving in pursuit of what you said If it all reveals your nature so alive I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky you can of your grace If creation still obeys you so So alive. The mountains bow in reverence. So alive. If the ocean roars, your greatness. So alive. So alive. For if everything exists to lift you high. So alive. If the wind goes where you send. Surrender. 
Dear Jesus, sweet lover of my soul, thank you so much that your love covers a multitude of sins. I pray right now that, Lord, that I might know that forgiveness, that I might experience that in my life, and that, Lord, each one of us, that we might be able to sense and know how deeply we are loved. Thank you for the powerful words of this song that says that for one, you would come. For one, you would look. You'd leave the other 99 behind. Lord, right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw that one I pray that you would bring us close. I pray that you would pull us into the place of your embrace so that we would know that freedom can be ours, forgiveness can be ours, healing, damaged emotions can be restored or made right. Lord, we're looking to you. We trust in you. Be with us now, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us in person or online. We're in a series entitled Moses, Ordinary Man on an Extraordinary Mission. Today, from a message found in Exodus 17, we will see the greatness and goodness of our God. We will see that the power of of our God is great. We will see that the provision of our God is great. And we will see that the grace of our God is great. We will go to the rock and understand a little better what that means. Tell somebody near you, I go to the rock. Let me begin by saying that we serve a great big God, God who cares for us when we are in trouble, God who sends us help in time of need, God who provides for us when it seems impossible. Let's review where Israel is on their journey to the promised land. So far, we have seen the children of Israel led by God to the shores of the Red Sea, a place called Baal Zephon a geographical cul-de-sac which pinned them in position by a pursuing enemy army. They were without escape. Yet God parted the waters of that great body of water and allowed his people to walk through on dry land, in essence, making a way where there was no way. Afterwards, they were led by God to Mara, where foul-tasting bitter water was made sweet as a tree was thrown into the source of the supply. Everyone was able to enjoy its cool refreshment. In the wilderness of Sinai, where they ran out of food supply and their hope for natural provision had evaporated in the desert sun. God gave his people manna, prepared in heaven's kitchen. It was served in the morning. And then he blew in quail in great quantities at night, enough to satisfy all of his people. And in each of these instances, Yahweh responded by giving his people what they needed, However, his people never seemed to learn that Yahweh was with them and would provide for their needs. They never learned to trust God or God's servant, Moses. It seemed like they never learned the lessons of faith. 
So the children of Israel faced another crisis at a place called Rephidim. And once again, they chose to blame their leader. Now at Rephidim, they ran out of water and they despaired greatly. Rephidim was their last camping place before Mount Sinai. So the mountain of God must be close to their location. Rephidim is in the region of Horeb. The Hebrew word Horeb means a desolate region or ruin. At Marah, the water was bitter. But at Rephidim, there is no water. This is an extremely serious problem. People and livestock require significant amounts of water and cannot survive for long without it. This then is a matter of life and death. Stressed out by their circumstances, the Israelites quickly forgot about God's faithfulness to them in days gone by. And they focused the blame on Moses, God's chosen leader, for their current dilemma. Let's read the biblical account as recorded in Exodus 17, beginning at verse 1, where it says, The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sinai, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt and make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Let's pause our reading there for just a moment. You know, it's easy for us who have seldom been truly thirsty and have never faced the likelihood of death from a lack of water supply to be critical of these people. After all, God had saved them again and again, and apparently uh, they were in another hopeless situation. We know he wasn't going to abandon them now, we know the end of the story. Undoubtedly, he'd rescue them again. Why wouldn't they know that? But it's much more difficult when we're in a situation. And if our throats are parched and our children are crying for a drink of water, it's easy for us to imagine how we could forget God's past providence too. Because the pressures of the immediate can cause us to forget. Looking at the immediate and seeing no water supply, they have cause for fear. But looking back, they also have a cause for faith because God had saved his people again and again. But the stress of the moment was more than what they could handle and God's people accused Moses of bringing them out of Egypt to kill them. Perhaps they doubt his motives as well as his leadership abilities. Moses, acting as God's agent, has brought them salvation time and time again. However, when they're hurting, they lose faith that God can do it again, and they wonder whether Moses can help. So they say, give us water to drink or else. The Israelites are ready to stone their God-appointed leader, Moses. Like road rage, which boils over when a driver is provoked by the smallest incident, their anger, blame, and suffering are directed towards the man of God, and they threaten to end his life by stoning him. Yet as Moses routinely has done when he has faced a crisis, he turns to God for relief. He asks God what he should do. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. It says, Then Moses cried out to the Lord, 
What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. As an ill wind of discontent begins to blow through the camp, there's a wondrous intervention that comes from God. Look at what he says. Verse 5. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you at the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And the place he called Masa, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Let's break this passage down in the moments that we have left. You know, to some degree, a leader is responsible for the followers. While each individual has a real personal responsibility in a group, ultimately there's someone who must be held responsible and accountable for the welfare of the group. That person is generally the group's leader. And as the leader is also responsible for the followers' care and meeting the group's needs. So these thoughts lead to a question. And the question is this. Who is the leader in Exodus 17? Who has led Israel into the wilderness where they are right now? Is it Moses or is it God? The people keep blaming Moses for anything that goes wrong. But Moses is just following God like they are. He is a human instrument, a focal figure in their eyes, but he's not in charge, and he's not the one setting their direction. The beginning of verse 2 says, So they quarreled, and the Hebrew word is reeb, with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. The word reeb, which is translated quarrel, is often translated as plead, or strive, or contend, or chide, or debate. It is often used in a legal sense to describe a legal complaint. In this case, the people issue their complaint against Moses, demanding that he give them water to drink. In fact, Psalm 95 and verse 8 describes this as the hardening of their hearts, just as Pharaoh's heart was hardened in Egypt. Is it significant to note the use of the word reeb in verse 7? I believe it is. Because if we take a look at it, we'll notice that the word reeb is incorporated into the word meriba to describe the location. Notice how Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test at the end of verse 2? He makes it clear to God's people that their quarrel is not with him, but with God himself Moses is simply God's servant, and he is there to do God's bidding. As we try to understand the gravity of the situation that they find themselves in at Rephidim, I need to ask, did you see the question at the end of verse 7? It's a remarkably rebellious question. It's not a groan. It's not a lament. It's not like the psalmist would say, how long, O Lord? Rather, it's a test. Is Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, among us or not? 
In other words, if you're with us, God, prove it. How many times have we done this ourselves? Okay, God, prove yourself. Do it. Miracles now. Magic now. Supernatural occurrences right now. Healings now. Make me better now. Take this away right now. Do it. Aren't you real, God? It's the same sort of attitude that the Israelites had. Think about it. His presence was obviously with them. Manifested as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, he daily led them. And he had brought them to camp at Rephidim. There it was. They could see the pillar of cloud or of fire. And yet they have the audacity to say, are you here? Do you care? Are you listening? After all that he had done for them, all of the miracles, all of the plagues that led to their deliverance, after the bitter water made sweet at Marah, the rest at the oasis of Elam, the quail and the manna sent from heaven, they still say, we don't know about this God. Is he even here? And in all of this adversity, controversy, and pressure, God tells Moses to do five things. Number one, go out in front. Don't hide. Don't go alone. Take some spiritually mature and respected persons with you. Number two, take your staff in your hand, the rod of God. Number three, go to the rock. I will stand there before you. God says, go to the rock. Isn't a rock the last place that you would go to look for water? I can't even imagine going to a rock, banging on the rock, trying to get some water from it. Why, I'm not even sure that you could get hard water from a rock. Just like you can't get blood from a rutabaga or orange juice from a doorknob, you certainly cannot get water from a rock. What I have seen, though, is that God often works contrary to natural expectations. He works within the realm of the supernatural, and he wants to show his people something that is unbelievably profound in terms of their water supply. You'll remember that this particular region is the same one where Moses encountered the burning bush that began his journey as God's agent. Go to the rock. Then God said, strike the rock. When Moses strikes the rock, which is an Old Testament type of Christ, it's because God told him to. In one of the most incredible passages of Scripture, God tells Moses to raise his rod of judgment and strike the rock. Two psalms that commemorate this particular moment, Psalm 78 and Psalm 95, describe God as a rock. So in Exodus 17, we see that God is standing by the rock as it is struck. Do you see What's happening? God was not guilty, though he was on trial. God had not done anything wrong. He had provided for his people over and over again. And yet Israel is putting God in the witness stand. 
And God stands in the place of the accused. And now at God's command, the rod of judgment strikes God himself, not because he's guilty, but because the people are guilty. He gets the punishment that they deserve. And as a result of that judgment, as the rock is smitten, water comes out. The needs of a rebellious people are met as God himself bears the punishment that they deserved. They drink the water that they need and their lives are saved precisely because God took the judgment that they should have received. The guilty verdict is read. But instead of the guilty being punished, God is. God receives the judgment that he didn't deserve. And the guilty receive the grace that they did not deserve. Do you follow that? The God we serve, the rock of Israel, is a God of mercy. He is the one who bears his own judgment for the sins of his people. It's amazing. Some people think that the God of the Old Testament was a harsh God. But here we see that God is a gracious and compassionate God. One who even in the Old Testament stands in the place of the guilty, bearing the punishment on behalf of his people The stricken rock shows us the gospel of grace even in the time of Moses. Let's look at that a little more as we see that the rock is a beautiful picture of Christ. And this is a rock at Horeb. Some that think even that this was the actual rock that was struck. It's a great place for a tourist to go and to be able to visit. You can Google it and see it yourself. But do you know that Psalm 78 in verse 35 says this? They remembered that God was their rock and that God most high was their redeemer. 1 Peter 2 verse 6 declares, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4 says he is the rock. His works are perfect, and his ways are all just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 2 says there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Second Samuel 22 and verse 2, and he said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. And then go down a few verses to verse 32 of Second Samuel 22 where it says, for who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? And so we can see that God is identified as being the rock, an Old Testament picture of Christ, a type of Christ. And we can see that when the rock is struck, that number five, there is a fresh supply of water that flows from the rock for all the people to drink. Are you still wondering whether this rock is a type of Christ? Well, look at what the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 10 and verses 3 to 4, it says in reference to these people, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. The apostle Paul calls the water that flowed 
a spiritual drink enjoyed by Israel in the desert. He emphatically asserts that the rock was Christ in symbolic form. He makes it clear that Christ was the source of this supernatural water that saved the Israelites from perishing at Rephidim. The provision of water from the rock is seen at the beginning of their wilderness journey, but it's also seen again near the end of their wanderings when Moses sins in a fit of rage by hitting the rock a second time. We only understand the gravity of what he did by understanding the typology of the rock representing Christ. Paul drew the conclusion that Christ had followed them around in the wilderness providing water. And all of the Israelites in the wilderness ate the same spiritual food and they all drank the same spiritual drink. They were all drinking from a spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Years later, when he was on the earth, Jesus identified that he is still the source of supernatural water for believers. In John 4, he has an encounter with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, and he says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again in reference to the water from Jacob's well. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst But the water that I will give will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus is the never-ending source of supply of a spiritual drink and of spiritual food for believers today. However, the supply was provided only after Jesus was struck by the fiery wrath of God on the cross of Calvary. It was then that the Holy Spirit came from that smitten rock to dwell in all believers. In fact, Christ himself, his words are recorded in John 7 in verses 37 to 39 where the Bible says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Glorified means crucified. Crucified means smitten. And as we think about that, I want us to consider in conclusion. Psalm 35, Psalm 95, rather, verses three to eight. It says, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. In this psalm, God highlights the negative example of his people. They put me to the test. They put me to the place where I needed to prove who I was even though they had already seen my works. The point that is being made here is that God will care for his people. We are his flock and we are under his care. He is our leader. And we must remember his faithfulness and we must believe for it in the days ahead even in those days where we wonder, God, what am I going to do? Do not harden your hearts by seeing his works in days gone by, but denying his power today. 
Do not doubt his ability to move or to make a way. And this may be the very word that some of us need to hear right now. You hear the urgency in Psalm 95. Its emphasis is on today, not tomorrow. We read it together today if you hear his voice. And right now in this sermon, in this very moment, right now you hear God's word speaking to you. It's urging you, do not harden your hearts. God can save you today. He can provide for you today. He can deliver you today. God can make a way where there seems to be no way, and he can do it right now, today. He can take that which the enemy meant for evil and cause it to work together for our good and for his glory, and he can do it today. Don't harden your heart. Stay soft towards him. Release your voice of praise. In another psalm, David declares, the Lord lives, blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. Let's pray together. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let me find the provision that I need in you. The forgiveness that I need in you. The help with my day-to-day -day survival. The hope for my future. The healing that I so desperately long for. Help me find that in you. Be the rock of my salvation. Help me to trust you in good times and in bad times. Help me to remember your faithfulness and remind me that your mercies are new every morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And as we conclude, Let's just take the opportunity to sing it together. Join with the worship team as they declare Christ alone the cornerstone.